been out in the basin here the last few days with Dan Lowe. Um, when we refer to the basin, it's the Uinta Basin uh, in the surrounding area. But we've been working on a few projects, trying to put some finality or take them a little bit further. It seems like every time we, we get out there, we answer some questions and get a few more. <laughs> We come full circle come and full. find out we still need technology. <laughs> we still need technology. We still need um, a personal drone to fly us old parts out there. <laughs> but no, uh, maybe update us. Dan, tell, tell the story about Or is that a story you can tell? Or what did you... I think we beat it to the point where we can tell that story. Well, there's many stories that occur. Right, there, yeah, well, let's tell some of the good ones. Well, tell the ones that someone isn't expecting me to be quiet about. Right. Um, one thing that we know about the site is that, I think it was back in the 1950s, there was a, uh, a prospector, we believe, who went up to this particular site might not want to give them the name. Well, I already said that the name, we can edit it out. I know, but you can edit it out. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Just say a unique geological formation. Okay. A unique geological location. Where it looks like water came up out of the ground. Where it looks like water <laughs> came up and out of the ground. You want to tell the story? Q, Q, Q. <laughs> um, this uh, man, by himself, traveled into this unique geological, geological formation. formation. And uh, I, I don't know what was in his head. All I know is that when he got into the middle of this thing, the ground broke out from under him. He figures he fell about 15 feet. Yeah, I didn't break anything. It uh, bruised him up a bit, and he could hardly see anything down inside this cavern that he just fell into. Um, while he was down there trying to figure out how the hell he was going to get out of there, because he knew that nobody knew he came in there. Yeah. <laughs> and so he's looking around, and he's trying to figure things out. And he's feeling around and he picks up what he believes to be some Spanish armor. He puts it down, starts feeling around again, picks up something that feels like a, a heavy bar, you know, silver, gold, lead, we don't know. And he didn't know either. And he, he stands up, looks up, still thinking, how am I going to get out of here? And there's a rope sitting there dangling. Grabs the rope, pulls himself out, stands up, and there's an Indian standing there looking at him with his arms crossed. And the Indian says, damn good thing I seen you come in here. He says, you'd have never left. He says, and if you ever come back, you'll never leave. Now this guy, I would imagine he's passed on by now. But he passed it down to another individual who went up there. And I probably ought to keep that one to myself just because I was asked not to say anything. But the thing is, is right after two of my friends had relayed their side of what happened up there, I get a call maybe a day after that from a friend who's never heard this story before in his life. And he calls me up and he says, hey, he says, I got to tell you a story about a friend of mine who goes deer hunting up at this place all the time, every year. And I got to tell you what happened to him. And I said, okay. And I didn't think for one minute that he would even mention that area. Unique geological, Unique geological formation. formation. Okay. We'll call it location from now on. The formation location. 
Don't confuse me. <laughs> um, so he starts to tell me this story, and he says his buddy's going up the ridge towards this location, and uh, a deer comes running up and over the top just before you get to the location, and uh, it runs out on the rim, and he knows that if that deer keeps going, it's, it's going to die. So he takes a shot, the deer disappears over the edge. So rather than hike up to this feature yeah. location, mm -hmm. he hikes around the side of it and over to the north side. Yeah. And uh, sure enough, there's a deer laying there dead, you know. Doesn't know whether he hit it or whether it died from jumping off a 40, 150 Being foot. Being scared and jumping. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, he starts dressing out the deer. And here comes a rock rolling out of the bushes from the direction the deer came from. And uh, he doesn't think too much about it. He just figures the deer might have knocked some rocks loose or something. And, and uh, goes back to dressing out the deer. He's got someone with him. And uh, here comes another rock. And he thought, what the heck? And next thing you know, he can hear this growling. He says, and it, I couldn't even describe the growl. It's something I've never heard before. And uh, so he decides that let's grab this deer and let's pull it down the hill further and get away from this feature location. <laughs> yeah, I don't know any bears or mountain lions that uh, throw rocks. <laughs> well, they might. Um, so they drag it down about halfway down the hill into the next drainage and goes back to dressing out the deer and here there's growling again coming from the bushes up above and another rock comes at him <laughs> and another so he says to heck with this they grab the deer and they drag it all the way down to the bottom where the ponds are mm -hmm. and uh it stops and that's pretty much that and then the well, birds. Well, um, and you said that that you got that story within a day or two of getting the other story yeah. about the same area. Yeah. So that was kind of a, a unique uh, chance or circumstance that you know happens, <laughs> but not all the time. But uh, and then uh, does. <laughs> you, you told me some other stories about a <coughs> large unidentifiable bird in there that somebody encountered, and you might not want to tell the whole story, but well, I just wanted to mention it because of what I found when I was down. Yeah, there. I can't say that I have permission to tell their story. Right. Um, I don't believe they told me to keep it quiet, but because I don't know, I will. Right. Let's just say that there's been several accounts of people right in that general area, not necessarily right at the feature, but close by, have had an encounter with a very large bird that they describe as being raptor type, but it wasn't an eagle, and it's not a big horned owl. They describe this thing as three and a half to four and a half feet tall, standing wow. on the ground. Um, and it was blocking their path from yeah. coming in there. Well, when we were down in there... Well, wait one okay, second. Go ahead. One incident, one particular case, I showed... I, I looked and looked at different birds, and so did these guys when they got back from what happened to them. And right. I, I would love to tell you their side of it, because <laughs> it was pretty interesting. But anyway, they looked and looked trying to figure out what kind of bird it was and they never come up with anything well i found i think a friend of mine sent it to me in fact it i think i know who sent it to me he passed away a few months back steve uh, dave. Oh, dave and he sent me a picture of a harpy eagle and maybe, like i don't know whether it was him or not yeah. but i sent that picture to one of my friends uh, that was there mm -hmm. and seen it and they're not certain, but... <laughs> That's the largest eagle in the world from South America that, like, eats yes, monkeys. Yes, <laughs> and according to the boundaries that I checked, he was at least 
I don't know, a thousand miles to six hundred miles out of his north of that where he should yeah. be. Yeah. Well, the reason I thought that was interesting was when we were down in there, I was down looking around and there's some really unique pinnacles of conglomerate rock which is probably why the prospector was in there because he was probably looking at the unique formation and looking at the prospects and between two of these pillars is a huge nest it's it's at least six feet in diameter bigger than any eagle's nest or ostrich's nest or uh, any bird nest I've ever seen, I could have literally climbed up there and slept in it. You see that big old nest up there, uh, Tracy? But, uh, and I'll show big pictures of that. I took some video of it. It was really hard to angle and it was up in the cliffs. But uh, I found that pretty interesting. That kind of goes along with that story. Could have been a pterodactyl. Well, could have been. Well, all on our did way. Did I say that right? You're a paleontologist. A pterodactyl? Yeah. One of them things. Well, on the way in, we walked <laughs> underneath a large red tailed hawk's nest. Yeah. And that hawk was dive bombing us as we were going up. And then as we were getting closer to the rim, a coyote ran out and across in front of us. And if anybody knows anything about coyotes, the Native Americans would have just turned around at that point and left <laughs> if a coyote would have run out of that place. Because that's supposed to be bad omen. So that's when the coyote knew that you guys weren't Indians. Well, we, w we went down in there and it was really thick. Uh, uh, the duff was maybe two feet deep. Uh, a lot had changed. There had been a fire in there, and then a whole bunch of trees had grown up in there because you could see some of the old dead. Oh, I got another buddy pole. that went up there, wanted to go and investigate it. He went by himself. Yeah. And this guy, he's, he's got cojones that big. <laughs> <laughs> and he went up in there by himself, and... He says nothing really strange really happened. He says the only odd thing was is there's an old dead tree up there and there was a bunch of them old turkey buzzards sitting, sitting in, in the there. tree. <laughs> and he says usually when you approach them, they'll fly. Yeah. He says they just st stood there and looked at me like they were waiting for lunch. Waiting for something <laughs> to happen. <laughs> Maybe they'd seen something before. <laughs> well, who knows? It is a really, uh, really odd location. Uh, very, I've never seen another geological formation quite like it. I have. Well, it's uniform. It's it's just strange. And we need to go investigate it one of these days. Yeah, another, another one. But anyway, that's that's one of the projects we worked on. We were trying to find that that pit, that hole to see if we could find uh, what was in it. Yeah, no, there's supposed to be a cavern. Like now, I said, the guy fell through it. But there's so much dang dead fall. Yeah. Yeah. Um, on the uh, on the other project we've been working on, we went to. Um, well, can we tell about what we did with the uh, easy res? That would be an interesting thing. Cause we, I got some no, video, no, video no. on pictures of the easy res. Yeah, go ahead. I <laughs> Don't see why we can't. <clears throat> we went up to a potential cache site, and a friend of ours, Greg, has an Easy Res Pro, and we set it up and took some different readings <coughs> to try to determine if there was a a mine or a hole or uh, we we wanted to learn how to well we we needed to learn how to use this thing, so it was a great opportunity to do some practice. And we did kind of find some pretty cool things out about using that. Um, we did find what we believe was the groundwater level. Um, I believe we found a void or an anomaly where there was high resist or high resistivity. <laughs> a void would be high resistivity. Uh, you'd have high numbers. High numbers, yeah. yeah. We had or that one band scary. where we had some high numbers. 
Um, yes, <laughs> a void would be high numbers. Right. Water would be low numbers. Right. We had the high numbers, yeah. and then when we hit the water, it went to low. Right. So <clears throat> didn't really answer anything, but we took it home and we tested it on on the septic tank. Yeah, in yeah. the front yard, and pretty much confirmed what we had already knew about and what was there. In case you were curious, uh, poop puts out high numbers. <laughs> <laughs> well, water, water. Uh, okay, you can call it water. Make yourself feel better. Water is uh, water puts out the low numbers, don't it? Waters and veins. Stop it. Put out, puts out the low numbers. It was that band. Water is low numbers. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was the band underneath the tank where right. we, but between that, that we got high numbers again. And then when we got into the groundwater, the level that we knew the groundwater. Water, there wouldn't be any resistance. Yeah, you know, electricity's going to pass flows right, right through, through it. it. It's the voids that gives you the high numbers. Right. Or or heavily where it's been dug and the soil's not as dense as everything right. around it then we took it to the backyard where there wasn't any septic system and basically repeated the, uh, the experiment twice and and when we repeated it it was repeatable <coughs> and so i felt like that we started to gain a little bit of knowledge about how it works uh, this thing's a very simple Right. piece of equipment but this one is set up to where you can get a little more complicated with it and plug it into the computer and it'll actually give you a layout a picture 3d uh, image. 3d image yeah. of what's underground but well if, I don't have the patience for that if anybody <laughs> has any experience with it uh, please put a comment in the in the video below because we'd be interested in adding to our knowledge about it or anybody else's experience because we're learning here just like uh, a lot of people, uh, the technology. And that's one of the things that's been difficult to do, the research, is we need to get, we're at a point where we need higher and better equipment, uh, more technology, the be better technology to identify where, we need to identify where the exact location is. We, we have the big location. Why don't we just get s specific? Go ahead. The equipment that I can see that we need to get our hands on, I don't care where it comes from. Um, thermal in imaging on a drone would be right. cat's meow in certain circumstances. Right, we've used it, that before. We've had access before, right. but and we it, don't have that now. So. And it's it's not a cure-all uh, technology. It ha there's certain sites where that is probably the best choice. Right. Um, I'd have to say tops on the list would be a magnetometer on a drone. Right. Um, I've been looking at two of them, and that's all I can do is look. Uh, mag on a drone would fit several different sites. Uh, Help in the rough terrain sites a lot. Magnetometers seek magnetic anomalies. They do not search for gold. They don't search for silver. And... I've heard it many times, they search for metal. No, they don't. They look for magnetic disturbances caused by the metal being there. Right. Um, another technology that would be nice to get in our arsenal someday would be LIDAR on a drone. Not chintzy, wannabe LIDAR. They need some good LIDAR. Right. Because we got some pretty big canopies to get through in some cases. And that's the same technology that geol that uh, archaeologists have been using in South America to yeah. discover all those yeah, Mayan cities. Yukatan, yeah, all those Mayan Guatemala. cities, and they're covered with the jungle. Yeah, basically what LIDAR does is it, it measures the exact distance from it to the ground, ground solid. Um, right. If we had deadfall laying all over here, if the LIDAR cannot get through that deadfall, you'll see the deadfall. Right. But because it shoots out millions of laser points, um, it's going to find its way through. To the ground and give you an pretty image. Pretty much. Yeah. No matter how much gross there. Right. And 
it's just awesome the way it works. They, they refer to it as stripping the vegetation. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, and it reveals anything that's sticking out of the ground, you know, like a foundation. Anything man-made, it just right. sticks out like a sore thumb. Right, right. Like now, old trails. It would help with uh, this project we, me and Tracy went on today that you gave us the information about. How? Uh, to strip away the vegetation and show us uh, image of what may be behind the vegetation. How about, you mean like in the, a trail? Or a cave <laughs> behind the vegetation. Okay, I see what you're saying. Um, anyway, yeah. today uh, Tracy and I went to a site. I'm going to let Dan tell the story because he's the one that found it. I wasn't it. there. I, I know, but I'll tell about what we did today. We went into a series of caves. We didn't find the ends of these caves. We were probably in there for two, <coughs> two, two and a half hours. Actually, uh, a very credible friend of mine found that cave. Right, and we were crawling around on our hands and knees. Uh, there were some chisel marks in the wall. Um, the caves looked like a combination of mine slash cave. Uh, 